there, banditos. Welcome to another episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits. I am Mike Farah, and as per usual, we have another great guest for you today. His name is Jose Villarubia, and you know Jose primarily as a colorist, and a colorist he has been for many, many projects over many amazing artists, uh, People like Jay Lee, people like Bill Sienkiewicz, J.H. Williams III, uh, Carrie Andrews, the list goes on. Um, he has really added with his colors a lot of depth to the projects he's been on. Uh, he, in fact, worked on Batman Year 100, which won the 2007 Eisner Award for Best Limited Series. That was with Paul Pope. And he colored virtually the entire run of Sweet Tooth, um, where we know became a series um, on television as well. So he has a lot of great things to say. He is, he is a student of the art of coloring as well as illustration and just comics in general. And you'll hear a lot more of that uh, when we get to the interview, which is right now. So this is Jose Villarubia. Welcome Jose Villarubia to the show. Jose, how are you? I'm very well. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you for coming on. Uh, we're going to start you out with the same question we do with all of our guests, which is how and when did you first discover comic books? Um, I grew up in Spain in the 60s, and um, I don't recall a time where I didn't read comics, because for my generation, uh, children read comics. That's like the first thing you read were comics, not newspaper comics, but comic books. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of like an extension of children's books. So I remember, as long as I remember looking at anything, I remember reading comics. And do you have, uh, did you start collecting them when you first started reading them? And do you have any of those original ones that you, if you can remember them? Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't start collecting them right away. Uh, they would just be like, you know, when you're like six years old, you're not a collector. You're just reading them and keep them. You don't throw them away. They were indisposable. Uh, so we would keep them. But especially in Europe, you had some that were really nicely hardbound, like all the Tintins were hardbound. And uh, the Asterix, all the French ones. Uh, the Spanish ones were in floppies, but um, eventually they started to do collections that were also bound, and I have a lot of those still, uh, you know, in my family home. That's great. Um, besides a comic book colorist, you're also known as a fine arts photographer and a professor. How, how did you work your way through those different careers, uh, or what, in what order did it, uh, those, those, three or maybe even more um, different vocations kind of come together? Well, um, I always liked comics and there was no such a thing as studying comics in Spain. Um, so I went to the fine arts uh, school, the university, mm -hmm. and I did my first year there. And then I transferred and I went to, Baltimore, uh, to uh, Maryland Institute College of Art here in Baltimore. Uh, where I got a degree in general fine arts, and there wasn't even an illustration department back then, so I didn't. I did. I would do little bits of illustration on the side, but nothing substantial. And I tried to get a job with Marvel and DC uh, when I was like seventeen or eighteen, and I, I didn't get through. And so I gave up on the idea of being a comic artist then, and instead I did a master's degree in painting. And I started exhibiting painting and doing portrait commissions. And um, I started teaching college courses when I finished the master's uh, at State University, Towson University. And uh, so that's when my teaching career began. And it's been 38 years ago, so a long time. And um, I started to exhibit in a gallery in Baltimore. And then... I switched to fine art photography, and then I started to exhibit in New York in a gallery in Soho. And for about 10 years, I did fine art photography almost exclusively, um, in addition to teaching. After that, um, I became friends with Jay Lee. 
he asked me if I would do painted colors for his comics. He was, he just had just, he was just creating Hellshock then. Mm -hmm. And so that was my introduction to working in comics and to work as a colorist. I went with Jay then later to Marvel. I went with him also to DC. And then I started to work with editors who gave me work pretty regularly. And that was about 30 years ago. So it was really this, um, you had somewhat of a different background uh, coming into comics and I'd say most um, in terms of, you know, the fine arts background already um, doing some teaching. Um, but it was this uh, relationship with Jay Lee. How did you first meet uh, Jay and and get to talking about sort of entering comics through the coloring aspect of it? Well, I, I first met Jay. I was a part of the art scene in Baltimore, um, fine art scene. And so um, there's a really great uh, cultural center, art center here in Baltimore called Maryland Art Place. And they have artists, they have artists in their board of directors. So I was one of the artists in their board of directors and they actually, they were doing a, an exhibition of fantasy illustration and they wanted to complement it with an exhibition of comic art. And so I was that guy and I invited Bernie Wrightson and Mark Hempel and Mark Wheatley and Ron Wilson and other local people that I knew, um, at least I knew of then. And then in the store, they told me that Jay Lee, who was at the, at the time living in um, near, Was near Washington, D.C., not far from here, um, that he was doing really good work. So I invited him and we became really good. He exhibited, he came to the opening and we became very good friends. And so you've ended up working, obviously, beyond Jay Lee with a number of um, sort of luminaries in, in comics, including Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, J.H. Williams III, Paul Pope, uh, just to name a few. I'm I'm curious, do you, uh, are these folks that um, request you? Are they, um, are they artists that you seek out? How do, how do those collaborations come about? Or are they just purely by editors bringing you together? Each one is different. You know, with Jay is because we were friends. And then the first job we did for Marvel, um, he had three crossovers. And one of them was by Bill Sienkiewicz, and I asked for that one. And so that's how I got to meet Bill. Uh, I pursued working with Richard Corbin really, really hard. And that mm. was uh, Axel Alonso facilitated that. Um, other people, I was paired up, not always by the editors. For example, with J.H. Williams, I was paired up by Alan, by Alan Moore, because he chose him to draw Promethea, and um, he asked me to do a segment of Promethea. And then we worked together in, in Desolation Jones. Um, Paul, I knew socially, um... I was also publishing with Top Shelf, uh, which I did my Alan Moore books with, illustrated Alan Moore books for them. And Paul liked those books. And then when he had his first chance to do um, a color book, which was Batman Year 100, he asked for me because he liked how I use color in my photographs. Uh, likewise, Jeff Lemire, I was friends with him because of, he was part of the top shelf family. And, um, so we knew each other socially and we liked each other. And so he wanted some to work for Sweet Tooth was his first color series. And he wanted somebody he could get along with and have a good rapport with, in addition to the technical skills. So... Uh, so every time is different, but I've been paired up by a lot with a lot of artists that I really love. That was the editor's decision. Um, I have been very, um, especially before at this point is a little different because I've been doing it for so long, but 
I really insisted on working with certain artists and I was, I persevered <laughs> until I got to work with them. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, it's very easy in comics. It's very easy because it's like you meet somebody socially, you know, they may or may not know what you do and super easy to say, Hey, if you ever want me to work with you, I'd be available. So you just make yourself available. And, you know, sometimes they say yes. Sometimes they take a long time. And years later, they say yes. But, you know, that's how it goes. And what are these collaborations like? Are are they, are they in most cases, collaborations in which you are, you know, actively communicating with the artists as to what they want or they're looking for the colors to evoke? Or are you just... Um, getting the art and uh, coloring it to the best of your abilities. How does that work? It's all over the place. It, you know, there's no one way. Um, I, I always ask for the script, always, and for notes, color notes. I like to get them before I begin, but they're not always ready. So sometimes I get them after I color it and ready. Um, I like to get notes from the editor. I like to get notes from the artist and I like to get notes from the writer. And um, sometimes they have notes. Sometimes they don't have notes. It depends. Some artists uh, are have a very clear way that they want their work to be done. Some have some sort of ideas and some uh, they just leave it open. So every time is different depending on the artist. And uh, for example, when I work with Je with Jeff, with Jeff Lemire, he's always completely open. He's always like, he he used to give me suggestions, but then he would tell me that he liked my ideas better, which was very nice of him. And so he pretty much leaves it open. Paul Pope always gives me a sense of what he wants. Um, and sometimes he gives me some very broad, color notes, but he's never nitpicky about what colors I use. Other artists are very picky. That makes it a little bit more time consuming. And is your approach generally the same when, when you get a coloring assignment? Is, is it always to, you know, get your hands on as much information as possible and then to, you know, do you sit, do you sort of sit with it and try to think about like, what are, what are this sort of color schemes and, and tones and things that you're going to be using? Or does it just kind of come out of you, you know, on the page by page uh, basis? At this point, you know, having done it for 30 years and having done thousands of pages, it's pretty uh, intuitive. Yeah. Uh, the way I normally color is, uh, if I can, what I'd like to do is to color like the whole, whatever it is, like if it's a single issue, it's like 20 some pages or whatever. Um, and then when I'm done, I like to look at all of the pages and then make adjustments. So there's the differentiation in the sequences depending on where they're happening and so forth. Sometimes I'm not, I can't do that because the work has to go to the printer immediately since I'm the last step before well the lettering is even done before I color things sometimes and they just overlap over the colors. So I just have to let it go. Whatever happens, happens. But yeah, I think about, I mean once I have an idea of what the the editor and the artist want, um I sort of um I have a good notion on what to do. Uh, and I can give them a couple of choices if they want to. And I'm very glad making corrections. Corrections take no time. Are are there any ones where you have a, um, any projects where you have sort of a strong point of view, um, that you, you'd almost have to push back on anybody in terms of their intuition as to color. And you say, no, 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 this is my, you know, I have a, this is the way it should really be done. I have in the past, um, yeah. without naming names, <laughs> uh, but sure. 
most of the time, if there's a difference of opinion, I'd really, uh, I'd really ask the editor to get involved and to figure out because sometimes you have different directions from the writer and from the artist, for example. And um, the editor can be very helpful in sort of um, putting all the information together. Um, but yeah, most of the time I'm keen on trying new things. And um, even when the artist tell me to try something different, I'm, I'm okay to try it because it's fun. Uh, so I'm pretty open. I just feel like sometimes the color adds more than others, depending on what approach I am told to take. And, uh, you know, I think that that's just the nature of, of the artwork in comics. Yeah. Now you said you've been doing this for, um, you know, more than 30 years. Are there particular projects that stand out as being ones that were really special to you? Yes. Um, I really love the first job I did with Richard Corbin was Cage. And Richard hadn't been colored by many people at that time because he had done his own coloring. So I tried, I did some crazy stuff in that book. And uh, I'm really proud of it. Uh, the first Marvel series I did, no, the second Marvel series I did with Jay Lee, um, Fantastic Four, one, two, three, four. That was all painted in watercolor. And I did some really crazy stuff there too that I really like. So um, those are two things that I am very proud of. On the opposite side of the coin, are there projects that you're also proud of that you like that um, maybe people have, or you feel like has not gotten sort of the um, credit or um, engagement that you, you would have liked, like things that are sort of overlooked gems, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. There have been some things that I've done that, I have really, I thought they looked good and they were really wonderful comics. Um, and then the reception was mixed, uh, not to my coloring. You know, nobody likes or hates a comic because of the colors. They, it's the story and the characters and whatever. Uh, I can think of one, which is um, I was with Carrie Andrews on Spider-Man Reign. And I had very high hopes for that book. Because I wasn't just, I wasn't really doing normal coloring. He was providing a lot of the backgrounds and I was integrating them with line art. And it was fun. It was really a very creative process. The story was great. Carrie's an amazing artist. And then people got really hung over um, sexual aspect of the story and stuff. And I was just like, it was a big fan stupidness about it and like nobody really appreciated it as much as they should have so that's had nothing to do with the artwork or the coloring it had to do with people's uh, taste i guess or lack of yeah i remember that um book i i don't i think i discovered it sort of after whatever controversy or reception sort of died down because I, I thoroughly enjoyed it uh, on my own, you know, not taking any baggage into it. So, um, and yeah, I thought the illustration and obviously the, the coloring really set the right tone. Um, I wondered if, um, you know, there, what your approach to coloring or, or just colors in, in general and what they add to a story, what is your what is your sort of theory or approach on that? Like, how do you see coloring within, you know, the great mix of comic book storytelling? Well, you know, the way I see comic, I, I see coloring, basically what I do with color is to finish the drawings. Mm -hmm. 
the drawings in black and white, even when they're finished, if you take them to color with rendering, whether it's a little bit of rendering or a lot of rendering, you're actually adding drawing into the drawing, not just color, because you're drawing, adding shapes and shadows and tones and things. So what happens when you do that is the one thing that you can do with color, and it's very useful, is you can clarify the the image. You can actually, for example, Paul has, Pope has this super strong kind of heavy brush stroke. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. when you look at the work in black and white, it's beautiful, but you're not sure how everything, what everything is. Uh, once you put the color, then this is wall, this is piece of fabric, this is smoke, whatever. Um, you can also separate the foreground and the middle ground in a way with color that is really good for making the images look more spatial and three-dimensional. Um, but the biggest role that uh, color plays in comics is that you can set the mood for a scene and you can use it uh, selectively, subjectively, so you can actually heighten uh, the suspense of a scene or the romance of a scene or the scariness of a scene, and depending on what kind of tweaks you make to your palette and what kind of choices you make um, in the page. So um, color is a little bit like the soundtrack in a movie that can really underline each scene in a way that sometimes you don't notice it, but it's there, or sometimes you really notice it. And sometimes it goes with the images and sometimes it goes against the images. Sometimes that's on purpose. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of like how I see what color can do. So it both plays a practical role in terms of delineating you know, certain parts of the images uh, from each other, uh, but also, a, you know, a more emotional role that you may or may not notice, but it's there. Um, I, I like yes. the soundtrack metaphor. That really makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I just came up with it. <laughs> Good. Well, <laughs> continue to use it. <laughs> um. I wanted to hop back to your collaborations with Alan Moore on the picture books um, that you did with Top Shelf. Um, one, how did they, how did those come about? And secondly, what was the experience like working on uh, one, something with Alan Moore, but also something that's, you know, more illustrative than uh, only coloring, I would say. It was fun. Uh, it was wonderful. I I had read Voice of the Fire in the original paperback edition, and I loved that. Um, uh, and I love illustrated books. A lot of I have a lot of turn of the twentieth uh, century um, books um, by different illustrators, and I thought it would be great to do an illustrated book with that. And I look for a publisher and um, encounter uh, Chris Staros from Top, Top Shelf, who also had thought about doing an American edition of Voice of the Fire. So um, I traveled to Northampton with Chris, and uh, Alan gave me a map of Northampton that he marked for all the different sites where the story the stories took place. And I took a cab with Melinda, his wife, fiance at the time, and we went about town for many hours and took a ton of pictures. And uh, that was the, the basis for about half of the illustrations. The other half I had um, actually models um, playing the roles of the characters in each chapter. And that was really fun. And then... Um, I worked with Chip Kidd on the cover, and that was really exciting. Um, Neil Gaiman wrote a really good intro. Alan was very happy with with that edition. And then Mirror of Love, <clears throat> I had read it as a text 
in a magazine. Um, and I had the idea to adapt it to the stage for a festival, theater festival. And my friend David Drake did an adaptation of it. I performed it, which was something new for me that I always wanted to do. And it was really fun, really hard. Um, and then uh, a friend of mine in France uh, suggested that we turn, that we illustrate it. And I told him that it had already been illustrated because it was a comic, it was a comic book. But that now that he mentioned it, I had this idea that it could be a book. And so Chris Darrow said, yes, we went to see Alan again. I had some sample images and Alan really liked them. And then that's how we did The Mirror of Love. Those both sound like such a, I don't know, evocative processes for, you know, getting to those illustrations. Um, so it must have been a lot of fun. The text in The Mirror of Love, as a gay man, it was very personal to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I felt like I had done a lot of, When I was doing photography, I did a lot of, uh, I would say, um, artwork that had a lot of an, an activist component. Uh, it was during the time of ACT UP, and um, I was very involved with like militant organizations. <laughs> and um, the um, so I was already had a good amount of experience doing um not just work that was art for art's sake but work that had political content mm -hmm. and so in a way it was easier for me to do a book like mirror of love where i could apply a decade of experience doing political art than you know just to do it as a comic or something which would have been there was already a comic for it Right. So that's a part of my career that people don't really know about because it happened right before the internet. And so what happened was I was getting into all these anthologies and museum collections with my artwork, with my photographic artwork um, from Columbia University Press and Passion and a whole bunch of other publishers. Uh, for a while, I was working on a monograph. Um, but since... None of that was digitized at the time. Uh, it's sort of like it never happened. Uh, because you have to go to the library and look for my stuff and then you can find it. But nobody does that anymore. So, and then there was really no overlap between that work and my comics work. Meaning the Soho Galleries and the comic book conventions in Javis, Javis Center, those worlds, there's no Venn diagram, diagram where there's like an overlapping area, zero. It's like completely different kinds of people, completely different points of view, uh, absolute uh, lack of interest on the other. And so, um, and yet I was immersed in both. Um, so doing Mirror of Love in a way was an outlet for a little bit of that. Uh, and to this day, I'm very proud of it. I'm talking about making a new edition right now in Spanish. There was one that came out three years ago, the second one in Italian with a new translation. So, um, yeah, I really love that that project. Uh, you know, both of those projects with Alan Moore, they were absolutely unusual in that it wasn't like I took a job to make money or or fame or a career step or anything like that. Uh, I did not want to be a book illustrator. I wanted to illustrate those books. And um, I didn't care about how much they paid. That was absolutely unimportant to me. So... Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's, uh, you know, since I've always taught 
I could always cover my expenses. So I had a lot more freedom to choose projects than other people that work in the industry. And I use that freedom. Is that the type of work, if you had the opportunity, that you'd like to do more of and to sort of bring that side of your um, creative self um, to bear on, on more sort of political and activist uh, projects again? Or do you think that was a period of time that you know, or those particular projects or what you wanted to work on. And if a project came like that again, maybe you'd work on it, but there's not something necessarily that you have a um, opportunity for right now. I mean, that was of a certain era. Um, that was, you know, that was in the 90s. And mm -hmm. that was, it seems like far away now in some ways. Um, I just did a translation of uh, one of my my best friend, David Drake. Uh, he's a playwright, and we've been very close since our early 20s. And he wrote a, an activist uh, award-winning play called The Night Larry Kramer Kiss Me, which is a coming-of-age story about hmm. semi-autobiographical semi vignettes uh that had to do with coming out of the closet and uh aids and politics and it's been really you know it, was, it ran for a long time off broadway there's been productions all over the world uh of it but it was it's been done in spanish in argentina but it had never been done in spanish in spain so um i just um, finish the translation of that into Spanish with uh, another super dear friend of mine, uh, Pedro Villera, who's a playwright in Spain. And so I wrote a new introduction for that, where I talk a lot about uh, not just the history of the play, but my history with activism. And, uh, and Again, you know, that was something that I did because I wanted to do it right. And the play is so rich with uh, allusions to American cultural um, information um, that it proved to be a big challenge to translate. But I love that. I love a challenge. And so, and working with a dramaturg like Pedro, we could make it, uh, we could make it very faithful to the original, but not awkward sounding. And so, um, yes, those things are always on my mind. And I love for them to be applied to something productive. Uh, I mean, I hope this book is going to come out as a book, that translation. And we'll do some events for it, but more than sales, you know, nobody really buys theater. Um, I hope it leads to uh, some um, new productions in Spanish. And I already contacted a very famous television actor that I think would be great for it and so forth. And so, um, and I've been working on another project, which is um, a queer biography of a gay artist. Um, and I've been working with two other gay creators for, uh, well, it's, just, it's been a while. Um, and uh, I would like some, I would like to uh, announce it soon, but we still have to uh, figure out some details about that. Uh, and that definitely has to do with doing the investment into doing something that actually matters to me because it has to do with subjects that I care about uh, much in a much more personal way than a lot of the escapist stuff that I do that I really enjoy. But uh, ultimately, uh, I feel like uh, it's not personal. Hmm. Well, it sounds like you still have, you know, uh, a foot 
in that world, so to speak, uh, and and also having you know some place, a continuing place for the fantasy, as you say, the escapist stuff as well. Um, to turn back to you know some of your coloring work, and you mentioned this before, Jeff Lemire, and you know one of the projects you worked with him on, or the primary project, was Sweet Tooth, which is I think probably your longest title that you were on for um uh, for as, as one colorist <laughs> it's almost 70 issues i think <laughs> yeah it is the longest um yeah that was uh i was so happy because um uh, as i said he chose me because he liked me personally um, you know we we got along really well um since he never really worked in color, I remember the first issue was like a little bit of a struggle trying to figure out the right approach. Um, and then I remember Bonsack Fisher Shot was uh, our editor. And I remember some of the covers from the first 10 issues, like I had to try different things. And there was a little bit of back and forth in there. Um, but then really after like the first 10 issues or so, it was just we were just running and uh i love the story i love his art you know the porn was super supportive and a project was begun by bob shrek but he left pretty soon after that and then porn took over and then he left and we had another editor later on as well so that it went through several editors and i got along with all of them with porn you know, he asked me to work with him on Infidel, and that was the first time I ever edited anything. And that was like a dream come true for me. And also to do a story that actually had some a meaning and something that mattered to me in terms of like xenophobia and prejudice and all that stuff. So, um, um, but yeah, with, with Jeff, uh, you know, Sutu was great. I loved that it was turned into that series um i um i'm really happy for its success i think it still reads very well and it's its own thing uh separate from the series um i gave a copy of the entire thing to my nephew and he just told me that he read it and he loved it and um uh, and jeff just sent me a message about half an hour ago <laughs> and he wants to talk about something something new mm-hmm so uh, we're going to talk tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to work with Pornsack again. That's one of the things I'm doing this year. And uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, Sweet Tooth holds a very special place for me. Um, and it just... Um, it's just... I really felt that... Uh, the I, I really felt like my coloring in that was an extension of uh of Jeff's mark making. Like we were really in sync in terms of how he worked and how I worked on it. Is there anything different that you do when you're working on a longer series where you know you're gonna have issue after issue, or is it just become I guess e easier or more um like you said, you're sort of more in sync as you get a rhythm, I guess, when it's um, over a longer period of time. Yes, uh, I think that's that's the only difference is that after you work with somebody, you sort of know how to handle the work. And uh, at the same time, um, yeah, I think, I think, honestly, the best people to work with are people that don't color themselves, like Paul Pope and Jeff and um, Jay Lee. Um, when people color themselves, and for some reason they kind of color the interiors, it's complicated mm -hmm. because they should be coloring it themselves. And when they get me or anybody else to color it, it's really complicated because uh, we're not whoever they are. So those have been the most challenging experiences I had 
but people that work almost exclusively in black and white are wonderful to work with. That makes sense. Is there a, <clears throat> would you say that there is a style that you have in the same way that you would say a penciler has a style? Would you say you as a colorist has a style that is different than a the next colorist over that would have a different take on things? And if so, how would you describe that style as a colorist? I think I do. I think, not that I try, I just think I, I have a certain taste and I think it shows in my colors. Like my sister can always tell if, if I do some fill-in pages in another comic, she knows which ones they are. Like yeah. she can just tell I color those. She tells me they're green. That's what she says. My green. pages are green. Interesting. Um, I uh, Sometimes I do things and I forget that I did them because I did them so fast and I sent them to the printer and I never saw them again. And then I see them and it's like, is that me? I think that's me. And then it's like, oh yeah, it's me. Um, so I think that the, um, generally speaking, um, in a normal or an average project, uh, I have, uh, I tend to, um, do palettes that are neither very saturated nor very desaturated. They're somewhere in between. Um, and I do a lot of like, sort of like uh, overlays to create certain moods, like especially cool. Like I would put everything natural, make everything naturalistic and then it would have like a slight bluish or like slight purplish. My sister would say it's like a group. <laughs> uh, right. And then um I really punch up like the action or emphasis or valent or anything like that with like bright colors. That's uh and flat colors. I prefer working in a not very render style style, uh as flat as possible, but I have done a ton of work that has been very rendered because that's what they are called for. Um, I think that uh, there is an objective, objective aspect to colors, but there's also a subjective aspect to color. And I really can tell... Um, what my colleagues do, like I notice their habits, uh, like which color combinations they tend to use and all that stuff. It's easier for me to see it in other people than to see it in myself because um, in other people, I see what they're doing when I, look at my own work and just think, well, that looks right. This is my taste. Yeah. You don't see your little maybe signatures in there that uh, no. others might see. Right. But I can see others. So I'm right. sure they can see mine. Yeah. Um, I've noticed on social media, I don't know if it's just Facebook, but it may be others that you... Um, sort of delve into a little bit of, I guess, color theory or color history. Uh, these posts that are um, from a colorist perspective. Um, what yes. is, what, uh, I mean, I, I think you're trying to educate, you know, you're still, uh, as, as a teacher, you're tr trying to educate sort of the public about colorists, but what, what would you say from these posts um, that you're trying to impart about the role the, that color plays or or things that people may not know about how color works that um the, these are able to illustrate i mean this uh the, the, that series began during the pandemic i was at home at, back at my family house in spain and i had all these plans to travel and well 
there was no traveling during the pandemic. So um, I had to do something. Um, so I uh, I was on sabbatical from school, so I was just doing my own personal projects. And so I came up with this idea. I had done a few posts about the topic before, but I thought I could really expand it. And basically, uh, with the time to do it and a captive audience, everyone in their own, wherever they were, um, I started to talk about, uh, basically, I read, I you know, I grew up reading Marvel and DC comics. I started reading them when I was probably like 12. And... Um, and I became very fanatical of certain artists very fast. And I would, my brothers and I would subscribe to a bunch of the series we had them sent to Spain. And um, and throughout the years, I've been buying reprints. And something bugged me about the reprints, but I couldn't really put my finger that this didn't feel at all like the comics that I remember. And I have so many of those comics. So one day, I just decided to see how did they compare. And they were completely different. And that's when I realized that contemporary reprints of older comics uh, are done with super bright colors. Hmm. They are the quote unquote same colors, but much, much brighter and much more saturated, uh, much darker. And so I uh, started talking about that. And uh, and then a lot of people jumped in, colorists or who were coloring for newsprint jumped in, people who do restorations and say that's what the editors tell them to do, even though they don't think it's right, jumped in. Uh, professionals jumped in. Gregory Wright, who was an editor and major colorist, gave a lot of information. Um, Nelson Kevich jumped in. You know, a whole bunch of people. So it was fun. And I posted, I think, over 350 uh, posts. I still post once in a while. I post mostly recommendations now, things that I think are done well. Uh, surprisingly, that I got a lot of compliments for that and then you know of course i started restoring the corbin library for dark horse yeah so yeah. that was like not newsprint at all super saturated color so it was a totally different kind of aesthetic but i got a call from dc and they asked me to uh restore uh swamp thing by bernie Wrightson for the absolute edition and i was i thought they were not going to be happy about what i had said about the previous reprints of swamp thing Regardless, they called me, uh, I said, yes, I started working on it. I had to do it really, really fast, which was crazy, but, um, but it was fun. And I learned so much looking at what Bernie had done with his own colors and what Glynis Wayne and others had done with the colors. Um, and, uh, and anyway, it's, it's the one absolute edition that actually has a recreation of the original colors as opposed to punch you in the face bright colors right i thought they would call me for more but they haven't so uh, uh so this that's that why why mess with perfection maybe swamp thing is the only one that's going to be the right I way of doing it I don't know. I really wanted to do like Adam uh, Neil Adams' uh, Dead Man. I would love to do that yeah. one mm -hmm. uh, for an absolute edition. And and you know, and, and Neil Son has talked to me and told me that he'd love for me to do it and stuff. And I told the powers that be at DC and radio have, silence. Radio silence. Yeah. Uh, so that's okay. I have I have a few other things to do. Um, <laughs> Um, we're going to get to those in, in just a minute. I want to ask about what you're, you know, currently working on, whatever you can tell us about it. But, um, before we do that, I had one last question, which we sort of started getting to already, um, which is you've done so much, you know, in this industry, particularly the comic book industry in terms of coloring and working with all these great artists on such amazing projects. Are there any, um, artists that, you haven't worked with that you would like to and any projects that you are sort of chomping at the bit to get maybe besides the neil adams uh, dead man recoloring it's going to be announced later this year but i'm going to be working on a major project uh with the artists that i represent uh which is das pastoras we already did an illustrated book uh that i edited 
that won the national award for best edited book in Spain. Um, and I'm going to do another one. I'm really excited about that. That the new one is for the American market. I want to do more illustrated books, um, as editor and, um, and there's some artists that I would like to work, but they're not necessarily the most famous. They're just artists that I think are amazing and maybe would like this opportunity to flex their muscle in, in doing fully rendered illustrations. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I would like to do more, edit more illustrated books, uh, I'd like to edit um, more comics, uh, but you know, after I did Infidel, I had several people approach me about editing different things. But Infidel was really substantial. Like it really, I felt it mattered. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> if I'm going to put that kind of effort into something, I'd really have to get involved in it in a personal way I can't just do it as a job uh because I already have a job yeah um so yeah I would like to do more of that I definitely I'm interested in doing um more work in that area I think that in terms of who I would like to work with, um, you know, I've always been thinking about that, um, but the answers were in comic book artists or writers always. Sometimes it was uh, composers or playwrights or novelists or filmmakers, like I'm working with a novelist right now on this comic that, that we're doing, the queer one. Uh, and I just did that adaptation of a play with a playwright. So, um, yeah, uh, in terms of, I mean, this is gonna sound really, uh, it's gonna sound weird, but it's true. Um, in terms of comics, I met all my heroes and I work with them. So, you know, and, and the ones that I didn't work with is because they passed away, like my views, but I did meet him a couple of times. Um, so um I think that um the what I'd like to do more is to continue working in coloring, but uh to just um, continue expanding in terms of like other kinds of projects that, um, you know, maybe there's no overlay, like I told you before, between Javits Center and the galleries in Chelsea now, there's no overlap um, at all. That's fine with me. Maybe you can be the bridge. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's a that's a tall <laughs> taller. <order. laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never you never know what the future holds. Maybe we'll no. <laughs> um. So that all being said, um, what are the things on the horizon for you? What are you working on now that um you can let people know about? So if many anything. Have... I can yeah some some I can talk about um I tell you the easier ones first uh which is um I'm gonna with Matt Wagner and Kelly Jones we're gonna do the second volume of Dracula okay uh, we did the first one last year uh it hasn't come out yet but it was finished and that's been amazing just an absolutely amazing story. and working all the time with Kelly Jones now yeah. Um, um he, he's like uh like Paul Pope or Jeff Lemire with me. Like he sends me everything and I do everything and and I love doing everything with him because he's so great. 
uh, we will do the second volume of uh, Dead Romans with my friends. Uh, that is the first uh, series, and that was wonderful. And um, I'm working on not announced projects now with uh, um, my Carrie and uh, Pablo Raimondi, uh, my friend who lives in New York. And um, we've been working on a series, a new mystery series that hasn't been announced yet. Um, I'm working with a Spanish artist named Joe Bocardo for a new editorial, a new publisher. Again, it hasn't been announced yet, but we already started working on that. I'm doing a new project, a biographical project for Top Shelf that has a lot of the political content that I told you about that interests me is in this book. And I'm really excited about that. I just sent out the cover to them today. It should be announced very soon. Um, and I'm doing a super secret project for Marvel, which I haven't worked for them in a few years now. And this mm -hmm. is like, you know, exciting because it's not a run of the mill project. It's an interesting one. And, uh, and I'm going to do something with Guillermo del Toro, but I cannot talk about it either. So, wow. uh, yeah, that should be really fun. Um, and continued editing and restoring the Corbin library for Dark Horse. And um, I, there may be a couple of other things. I don't know. But those are the major ones. Oh, yeah. I think I may be doing something for France with a really, 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 really well-known artist. So um, that's on the early stages, but I'm very, very excited about that. For the French market. I just finished um, this project with uh, Peter Milligan and Ro Rufus uh, Deglo for uh, 2018. They wrote, I mean, uh, Milligan is like for me. And uh, he wrote this insane, insane sort of black comedy about refugees that is like harsh. And uh, Rufus did a great job with the art, and and that's been phenomenally fun to do. But it's fun, but it's it has a serious component to it. So, yeah, that sounds like a full plate, if I've ever heard one. <laughs> a little, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no, I'm very, very thankful uh, at this point in my career. I think for years I was always looking for work. Uh, and at this point in my career, I'm happy to be approached by a lot of the things that I do now. And I think that people know that if they approach me, that I'm different from other people that do the job that I do because of my experience and for my point of view. Um, I think I'm also more outspoken than most people that work in my role in the industry. But I mean, I think that people that follow me on social media, you know, I write movie reviews and I write like recommendations on obscure forgotten artists and I just write whatever I want to write. And it's like, it's certainly not for everybody, but for some people, uh, they, you know, they respond to it. And that's really, really rewarding to me. Um, but um, yeah, but this year, 2024, hey, it's good. And we're back. I love talking to Jose. I think he has a unique perspective on coloring and illustration in comics. Uh, in fact, he's a teacher himself. And I think he knows how to talk about uh, comics and the process of coloring in a very unique, intelligent way. And I really enjoy hearing from him. And I look forward to all the projects he's going to be on uh, because he just continues to churn out that amazing work. So thank you, Jose, for being on the show. Thank you, all you out there for listening, for viewing, for rating, reviewing, subscribing, doing all those great things that help support this show. We have more interviews in store for you and we will see you 
next issue. Mm-hmm.